Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephen Buck. I'm the city manager for the city of Sanford. Welcome this evening to the Sanford Downtown Raise Grant Improvement Projects. This is a public hearing this evening. Uh, I'd like to do a brief introduction. Uh, ben, if you could pull the, the presentation up on the screen, please. So in this, in this uh, introduction for this evening, I'd like to talk to you about the Raise Grant that Sanford has been awarded. How did we get here in, in the whys? And a brief history of the partnership that we arrived here. So the RAISE grant is the Rebuilding American Infrastructure with Sustainability and Equity. It's a competitive federal grant through the U.S. Department of Transportation to invest in roads and transportation. It's been formally known as the Build and the Tiger Grants. <clears throat> Sanford's RAISE grant has been approved for $25 million from the U.S. Department of Transportation, with additional funding coming from Maine DOT, Department of Transportation, and the City of Sanford, estimated to be about an additional $10 million. History of the partnership path to raise, uh, this is very important. Uh, the city performed an engineered assessment of streets. We set our goals towards funding the, those, the improvements through the capital improvements program. We sought a coordinated partnership on our shared state municipal roads. The city has successfully partnered with the Maine Department of Transportation on a number of municipal partnership initi initiatives, MPIs, on roadways, and that's a shared funding uh, proposal as well as local construction. And the city sought to increase this relationship and, and inquired of the Maine Department of Transportation how best to amplify that partnership and our priorities going forward. Planning, it's all about planning. <clears throat> the city embarked with, uh, with the blessings of, of the Department of Transportation on what's known as a planning partnership initiative. Uh, I could put agreement, but it's a planning partnership initiative which was an enormous uh, task internally here for the city. So I'd like to, our Public Works Director, Matthew Hill, is here this evening. Uh, I'd like to uh, call him out as being the pers person responsible for putting that uh, planning partnership initiative together, the agreement, uh, and the agreements between the city and, and the Maine Department of Transportation. And through that, uh, we produced about a six inch thick document uh, that has all of the planning aspects, all of the initiatives that the city was working on, our transportation priorities, uh, and the work that we plan to do in our downtown. So that plan was to study, evaluate, plan and scope transportation projects on or adjacent to the state transportation system with MDOT as a partner. So that really started to further solidify the partnership that we have with MDOT, and you'll see that here tonight. The PPI was intended to address time-sensitive, locally initiated planning and feasibility studies outside of Maine DOT's normal annual work plan cycle. So how do we get our priorities moved earlier up and further on, and how do we best partner with the Department of Transportation? So during and after uh, the implementation of the PPI, the, con the city continued to partner with, with Maine DOT on municipal partnership agreements on roadways, especially in our downtown. From the finalized PPI and its focus on our downtown and the number of MPIs within our downtown, the vision had been developed. So a concept of a village partnership initiative, I think we were the first out of the gates with that, that piece, uh, was crafted with the department. And that's described as being uh, one of the segments of that is a once in a lifetime investments if we can successfully partner to access federal discretionary funds. So the raise grant is federal discretionary funds. So it was the village partnership initiative that the city embarked with the Department of Transportation towards making an application for a raise grant. We had a very rapid and accelerated process. Uh, the vision, multiple pre-existing MPIs, and the planning elements of the PPI were encompassed into a competitive grant application to the U.S. Department of Transportation. Uh, and I, I will note that the city could not have undertaken that, that enormous effort without the support of the Maine Department of Transportation and their consultants. The result was a competitive award of $25 million towards the construction of Sanford's downtown vision within the Village Partnership Initiative. It's a partnership of roadway improvements with the Maine Department of Transportation and now with USD DOT funding as part of that share. So I'm not going to get into the scope of work. Uh, this is a brief description in here because I know we're going to go over that entire scope this evening, so I'm going to set this slide aside. So in summary, tonight's presentation is the collaboration of partners, 
representing years, emphasis years of planning, program and funding partnerships, and the amplification of our working relationships to foster federal funds towards achieving our transportation improvements. I'd like to call out recognition and thanks that, that got us here this evening. Uh, first is that, that to the City Council for the capital programming and the adoption of our transportation plans. Uh, that has been a, a significant and recognizable investment that's being made by the City Council and that is tr truly starting to pay dividends in our community. I'd like to thank Matthew Hill for the PPI and the coordination of the city staff and resources. It was a tremendous effort in undertaking to get that PPI in place, which I believe led us to where we are today. I'd like to recognize the main Department of Transportation for their uh, very innovative programs under the MPI, the PPI, and now the VPI. We like our acronyms. They're, they're, they're really, they shorten things up. And I'd also like to recognize the U.S. Department of Transportation and the RAISE grant funds <clears throat> made available through Congress, our federal Congress. And I can't say enough about Senator Collins for her support of our application and, and the rest of our congressional delegation for the fund, funds and allocations in support of tonight's uh, RAISE grant presentation. So with that, I'd like to turn the podium over to Ernie Martin. He's from the Maine Department of Transportation, Project Manager, and he'll be talking to you more about the RAISE grant scope this evening. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Uh, like Steve said, I'm Ernie Martin with the Maine Department of Transportation. Uh, we're here tonight uh, for the preliminary public meeting, you know, to, to receive, to present, receive comments uh, on the grant project that Steve mentioned. Um, obviously, there's four key elements to the project, uh, a lot of elements associated with this project. You have the Main Street downtown piece, and then you have Cottage Street Route 202. Uh, associated with that, you have the William Oscar Emery Drive, Riverside Avenue, bike, bike path, safe routes to school project, as well as a, a park and ride associated with it, which is near Emerson Street. The purpose of this project was to basically provide economic opportunity and quality of life to the city of Sanford, you know, with a safe and most reliable transportation possible within the available resources. Uh, like Steve had mentioned, it's a it's a really unique opportunity right now that's out there for all municipalities. Uh, like Steve said, Sanford is the first to jump on the, the VPI, Village Partnership Initiative. Where, like Steve said, we're very acronym oriented, so that's, that's where it's at. Um, so if you haven't already, there's agendas on the, on the back of the table, kind of outlays you know, where we're going from after I get done talking. I'm gonna turn it over to the design teams. Uh, we have DOT design team is doing the downtown project as well as the Cottage Street project. And then the city is, is what we call locally administering the trail project and the park and ride. Um, so that's going really well right now. Still a long way to go and, and I'll talk about that in a, in a little while. So once the design's done, I'll come back and talk about that timeline and, and the communication that still is in front of us that needs to take place which is a lot. This is very early in the stage. We have a long way to go, and I'll talk about the schedule um, as we move forward as well. And then following all the presentations and, and discussions uh, from the design teams, I'll turn it over to Q&A, you know, for those that are in the audience as well as for those that are online tonight. 
So as uh, Steve said, Matt Hill, uh, city engineer is here tonight. Matt Preventure, his assistant uh, from VHB, who was doing the, as I mentioned, is doing the, the downtown and Carter Street portions. Um, Tony Grande and Ethan Flynn are here with that team tonight. Uh, for Goral Palmer, they're doing the trail project as well as a park and ride. We have Don Ettinger. So right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Ethan and he's going to start the presentations for the downtown and Carter Street and then he'll turn it over to, to Don to talk, talk about the trail as well as a park and ride and, and then I'll return to go over some other details. Thank you, Ernie. Um, as Ernie stated, my name is Ethan Flynn. I'm the project engineer uh, for the VHB projects. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you tonight about two of the four components. Uh, one component being the downtown improvements and the other component being the Cottage Street reconstruction project. Uh, and, and then, as Ernie said, Don, Don will be explaining the other two components. So to start off, I'm going to start with the downtown improvements project, um, which you can see on the screen now. Um, this project is composed of three separate corridors. There's Main Street from Emory Street to Route 202, which is approximately 0.6 miles. There's Washington Street. <coughs> which is from Main Street to High Street. And then there's an additional 300 feet of River Street across uh, beyond High Street. And those two segments combined are about 0.26 miles. There's, and then there's School Street from Elm Street back to Washington, which is 0.19 miles. Here's a zoom in of, of the, the first um, half of Main Street from Emory to Robert Street. I just want to go over some of the, the symbology and colors quickly. Um, the, the travel lanes on the road are, are shown in yellow, in a, in a bright yellow. The shoulders are more of a golden yellow. Sidewalks are gray. Grass slopes are green. The roadway center line is red. Right away is pink. And then your text, your striping, your lane lines, and your stenciling um, is black. There's also a north arrow on these slides in the upper right to give you a little bit of orientation. Um, the, the horizontal and, and profiles of, of all the sections of the downtown improvements project aren't changing. They're, they're generally staying where they are. The uh, light yellow section at the beginning here is going to be a mill and fill of the intersection. And then when you get into the brighter yellow, that's where our full reconstruction starts. Um, the full reconstruction is going to be new roadway and pavement, uh, new, new roadway pavement and gravel, new sidewalk, granite curb, and drainage on both sides of the road. Throughout the project, um, the impacts will generally extend to the face of buildings um, where, where the sidewalk abuts a building and where there is, uh, where the buildings are set back, then the impacts will be a, a few feet behind the sidewalk. The travel lanes in, in this first section here on the screen will be 13 feet in two lane sections. In, in the three lane sections, they'll be 12 feet. All parking areas will be eight feet wide and all sidewalks will be six feet wide. All sidewalks will be, con be concrete throughout the project and throughout the project, all sidewalks will be made ADA compliant and all the crosswalks will be put in safe locations per main DOT standards. Pedestrian bump outs will be placed at various locations at all the crossings. Um, for the most part, the crossings locations aren't changing, but in the middle of your screen here, there, there will be a new mid-block crossing across Main Street. Um, at the intersection at the beginning of the project, uh, the, um, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, traffic mast arm in the lower right hand corner will be replaced um, and all those crossing locations again will remain generally where they are today. On your screen is, is a rendering of that mid-block crossing 
at the Sunset Towers. This is a kind of an early concept that we developed in the, in the planning portion um, of the project. Some of the elements here are may, may change as the design progresses, um, but this will just give you an idea of kind of what the finished project may, the, the finished product may look like. Here's the second half of Main Street. Um, once again, there's a section that's in light yellow at the end, at the intersection of Route 202. That will be mill and filled as well, but the bright yellow areas will be full reconstruction. Um, that light area at the end, at the intersection of 202, is part of the department's build project. Uh, and as part of that, there will be some signal and pedestrian ramp improvements that will be happening next summer. That's not associated with this project, but this project will tie into those Im improvements. Once again, um, the bright yellow is going to be full reconstruction and those same elements of new roadway pavement, gravel, sidewalk, curb, and drainage on both sides will be re replaced. In this section, once again, the two lane sections will be 13 feet wide, um, but in the three lane sections in the second half, the middle lane will be 11 feet wide and the outside lane will remain 13 feet wide. Sidewalks will be six feet minimum, um, but in a large, in large sections of this second half, the sidewalks will be much wider and extending to the face of buildings. Again, we'll have pedestrian bump outs at all the crossings. Um, there's going to be a, the, the crossing in the middle of the screen will be shifted slightly um, to where it is today, to the right from the screen perspective to in front of the congregational church. Other than that, all the crossings will generally remain where they are today. Um, the RFB that's right out front in front of City Hall will be reset. And um, across from the park, um, you can see on the left side of your, side of your screen and kind of that, um, the call out in the upper left, the, the sidewalk there slopes fairly steeply to the entrances of, of those uh, businesses. So as part of this project, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be in putting the curb where it is today, having a three foot snow shelf, and then putting another curb that will raise the sidewalk to meet those entrances to that building. And there'll be ADA compliant ramps on either end of that section. Um, also in this section from Robert Street to the end, we're working with the city to extend their Sanford net fiber conduit um, throughout that corridor. Once again, here's, here's another rendering of what the finished project product may look like. This was, again was developed during the, the planning phase so some of the streetscape elements and, and finite details may, may change from what ultimately happens. Um, but but this, this rendering is from the perspective of the Congregational Church looking across the road. On the screen now is Washington and River. Um, at, at the far end of this project on the right side of the screen of River, um, this project will tie into a River <coughs> Street Im Improvements project that, that Don will, will, will touch on, but that's currently being advertised and is slated for construction next summer. Uh, once again, the areas in bright yellow will be full reconstruction, which will, again, include your roadway pavement, your roadway gravel, sidewalk curb, and drainage. In this section, travelways will vary from, from 12 to 14 feet. Sidewalks will be a six foot minimum, but and again, in a lot of cases, though, they'll be wider extending to the face of building. Again, there'll be pedestrian bump outs. Uh, Currently at the end of School Street, there, there's, there's a crosswalk across Washington. And as you can see on that screen, that crosswalk's gonna move slightly to the right. 
Um, the light yellow section on this in the middle um, are the two bridges over the Moosom River. Those will receive a mill and overlay. And as part of that, we will also um, be widening the sidewalk on the Moosom River to 10 feet wide. The existing sidewalk on the bridge is six feet. Um, and so as part of that, we're going to be adding another uh, concrete beam to the, to the dam side of the bridge and widening that sidewalk four feet and then replacing the existing bridge rail with something very similar to what's there today. As part of that, that little lookout between the two bridges is gonna be narrowed slightly because the sidewalk's gonna be widened into that. Um, Now you can see on your screen the uh, section of School Street. Um, again, School Street will be full reconstruction. Um, there'll be bump outs at all the pedestrian crossings. School Street is a one-way roadway uh, heading from right to left on the screen. It'll be a 13-foot wide road. Sidewalks will be a six-foot minimum, but for the majority of the road, the sidewalks will be eight and a half feet wide. Um, and one thing that's kind of unique here is the drainage upgrades if shown on the typical view in the upper left you'll see that white rectangle kind of in the middle the under drain will be placed at the middle of, of the roadway and the reason we're doing that instead of having drainage on each gutter line is because there's significant utility conflicts with doing that because the existing utilities are under the existing um, curb lines so we're going to have a, a single trunk, trunk line down the middle of the road, and then the, the drainage structures in either gutter line will, will drain to that trunk line in the middle. Now I'll, I'll, talk of, I'll zoom in and talk about the intersections. On the screen is the intersection of Maine, Washington, and School. This intersection will have the mast arm replaced that existing aluminum colored mast arm will be replaced with a black colored mast arm. Um, the crossings are generally going to stay where they are today. Here's the intersection of Washington River and High. Uh, in this intersection, the signals are on a span wire go that, that goes diagonally across the intersection. Um, in the after, those signals will be, will be put on mast arms, and the um, entrance that is across from High Street will be closed off, and a new 10-foot shared-use path will be put on that side of the roadway. Again, the, um, the signal will be upgraded with, with new pedestrian push buttons and pedestrian signals. That concludes the overview of the downtown improvements project. So now I'll start to talk about the, the Cottage Street reconstruction. Here's an overview of the project. The project limits start just beyond the bridge joint on Winter Street and extend three quarters of a mile to the northeast. Um, there's, there's been a recent pavement project. I think it, it may even still be ongoing that the DOT is currently doing. Um, our, our project will extend to that point and, and butt into that pavement joint. Here's a zoom into the first half of the project. Uh, on, on these plans, the colors and symbology that I went over on downtown are, are exactly the same. Again, there's no major changes to the horizontal and vertical profiles. The roadway will be fully reconstructed. So again, new, new pavement, new gravel, new granite curb, new concrete sidewalks, new drainage on both sides of the street. We've evaluated the retaining walls and we will be replacing any retaining wall that we deem to be in disrepair, but some of the existing concrete retaining walls were, were deemed to be okay. Um, 
so those will remain. So we'll be replacing the ones that are that are cracked, and some of the other ones where the grade of the sidewalk is is changing, we will be replacing those as well. Throughout the project, the the impacts will basically be to the face of wall in in the wall sections, but where there isn't walls, sloping may extend beyond the sidewalk to match into the existing grade. Travel lanes will be 11 feet wide. Shoulders from River Street to Brook Street will be three feet wide, but in all other locations, they'll be five feet wide. Uh, sidewalks on both sides of the street will be five and a half feet wide. And again, those will be upgraded to meet ADA standards and crosswalks will be placed in, in safe locations per main DOT standards. Here's the view of the second half of the project. Um, again, in this location, travel lanes will be 11 feet. Shoulders will be five feet wide. Sidewalks will end near the intersection of June Street. On the high side of the screen, they'll, they'll, they'll extend to Jeunesse, but on the low side of the screen, they'll, they'll stop at, at June Street. A rectangular rapid flashing beacon will be installed on the right side of of North Ave, which is on the left side of the screen. The crosswalk on the left side of North Ave from this perspective will be eliminated. Uh, the, the reason for that is we're trying to direct all crossings at the rapid re rectangular flashing beacon so that all the pedestrians crossing the street will be what will have that signalized um, crossing. Zooming into the intersection of Winter River and Cottage. Um, again, there, there's a separate build project that'll be happening next summer that'll take the, the existing signal that's on span wires. Um, it'll remain on span wires, but they'll be upgrading the traffic signals. They'll be installing pedestrian equipment, pedestrian signals, pedestrian push buttons, and making some sidewalk improvements to the crossings. Um, but that's not associated with this project that I'm presenting tonight. Um, and then Don will talk more about some of the River Street improvements. Um, but there, there will be a new 10-foot path installed on the left side of River Street. Um, so the end result will be a 10-foot path all the way around the number one pond. Here's the intersection of Cottage and Brook. Um, the, as part of this project, we'll be updating the, the flashing beacon that's there. It'll remain a flashing beacon, but it'll have brand new equipment. And the crossings will generally stay where they are today. In addition, um, there's going to be some drainage improvements that you can see on your screen in yellow here. They go down northern and then extend throughout the neighborhood all the way down to High Street. Um, the reason for that is with all the improvements, we're, we're, we're changing some of the, the drainage that's going off site. So we'll be um, evaluating and, and upgrading the, the drainage along this route. And there is the um, Sanford Sewer District also has the plan to upgrade some, some of the sewer components in this stretch as well. Uh, so the end result will, will, will this section will most likely receive some preservation payment after the fact, after all that trenching. And with that, uh, th that concludes my uh, presentation on Cottage Street. I'll turn it over to Don to talk about his two components.
Great. Good evening. Um, my name is Don Ettinger. I work with Goral Palmer. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present on a couple of these projects. Um, this slide here just summarizes some of the key contacts on the two projects we're going to be talking about, um, William Oscar Emery and Riverside Ave, as well as the park and ride facility over on Emerson Street. I um, want to just point out a couple of key names here. Uh, Jerry Dosty is, is a representative from Maine DOT, who is our current point of contact on the two assignments, uh, two projects that we'll be talking about tonight. Uh, Jared Winchenbatch is actually our, our project manager on this assignment, but un unfortunately he's not able to attend tonight. Um, and we have Seth Kimball here as a re potential replacement uh, with Aceto Landscaping. So uh, we are actually proposing landscaping on both of our projects. Um, and so uh, in the Q&A, we certainly field some questions there if you have any. All right, uh, you've heard some, some mention of the, of the mouse and promenade. Um, this graphic here is a, a good picture. We've kind of rotated the view from Ethan's, uh, Ethan's slides. Uh, so um, if we're looking here, there's number one pond. Main Street for, for Bering is up here. Um, City Hall is probably right over here someplace, maybe there. Um, and then this is River Street in blue. Um, this is the project that, uh, that the Ethan's projects will overlap. Cottage Ab comes down and ties in at this location. Um, and then Ethan's project also includes the uh, Washington Street back up here to Main Street. So you can see there's some overlap or some, some connectivity between the projects. Uh, the project in blue is a project that's already been designed. Um, I think if maybe if the city knew that they were going forward with a, a, a being successful in getting a raise grant, they might have delayed that and rolled that into it. But that project's been designed. It's actually out on the street for advertisement. Um, bids will be opened in the next uh, month or so, and hopefully construction will begin on that project next season. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on River Street, uh, but I do have copies of plans and Keller hearing plans should anybody have questions in the Q&A on that project. We're going to focus on the, the red project and the green project. It's kind of festive, Christmassy, um, but it wasn't intentional. Uh, so Riverside Ave is the red highlighted project, and William Oscar Emory Drive will be the green one. So uh, what I wanted to mention on Mouse and Promenade, Promenade project is the goal here is, is to provide a, a, a connection of a multi-use trail 10 feet wide around the entire perimeter of Number One Pond. So between uh, Ethan's projects that he's mentioned and these three projects here will be successful in doing that. The trail will be located on the inside um, of the roadways uh, nearest the pond. Uh, so we're going to talk about River, Riverside Ave first. Um, and for bearing, again, Washington Street is over here, and we'll be heading over towards Maple Street. Um, Gateway Park is located in this area, and the Mid, Midtown um, Mall is, is located here. I have a little cursor in red that you guys might be able to see. All right, first let's talk about the typical cross-section. Ethan had this on a few of his slides, so this is what the roadway cross-section will look like uh, when we build the project. Um, Riverside Ave will be full reconstruction, so it will be replacement of gravels and pavements. We're looking at 11-foot lanes in width. Uh, the shoulders will vary in width, minimum of 1 to 2 feet, but we'll make them as large as 8 feet if we're providing on-street parking, and we have areas where we're doing that. Uh, we have curbing on both sides, and the curb type will be slip form concrete curb. So it'll be a concrete curb. We have some areas where we'll have an esplanade, a, a green space between the curb and sidewalks. Um, some locations will be right up against the curb. So we're proposing a 10-foot multi-use path on the right-hand side, on the pond side, and a 5.5-foot minimum sidewalk width on the non-pond side. So here's a plan view. The, the colors, Ethan did a great job of describing the colors, so I'm not going to spend time on doing that. But um, generally speaking, the roadway footprint will stay the same. Its location horizontally and vertically will stay relatively the same. Uh, we're just going to change what exists within that, that footprint. Um, there's a right-of-way width on these, on these plans. There's that heavy dash line that's black that runs through here on both sides. That represents the width of public right-of-way. So that would be what the city owns for public use for this roadway. And we're pretty much maxing out that width um, with our new roadway footprint. Um, Washington Ave is over here, so we'll be looking at building 11-foot travel lanes. In this case here, two-foot shoulders. On the right-hand side, we're going to have a, the bituminous 10-foot um, wide multi-use path. Uh, the, the parking uh, that exists into, um, into the Gateway Park will remain. 
um, and we'll continue the path along, uh, along the roadway. On the opposite side, non-pond side, we're propi proposing a variable width media, uh, esplanade, green space, as well as a sidewalk. Um, you'll see driveway entrances are highlighted here in that uh, kind of rustic uh, yellow color. As we continue down the road, we now intersect with Winter Street, this location here. So our plans currently propose to design uh, roadway improvements up to the intersection, but not through Winter Street. Um, uh, we are aware it's a high crash location. Uh, we've actually had one public meeting on this project already. We've received quite a bit of feedback. So we're gonna look at safety improvements at this location. Um, as, as noted, we're proposing the multi-use path crossing there. So we'll be looking to try to enhance that and improve safety. Uh, through that intersection um, and then it continues on all the way to all the way over to, to Maple Street so the theme is consistent 11 foot lanes uh, probably two one to two foot shoulders curbing on both sides multi-use path on the on the pond side and a sidewalk on the non pond side the sidewalk actually ends at Acorn Street um, and there'll be a gap this block here is not proposing any sidewalk on that side So uh, at, uh, at Maple Street, that's when uh, Riverside Ave actually ends. It's a continuation of a roadway, but it turns into William Oscar, uh, uh, William Oscar Emery Drive at that point. So we're gonna, the next few slides, we'll talk about William Oscar Emery. Um, and if I can slide my cursor over, um, we're over in this area is where we stopped to the last slide. And so we'll be continuing down. The theme as we get into William Oscar Emery will change um, as shown in the next graphic here. Um, well, this is our typical section. Um, what's primarily different with this typical section is we're not planning to rip up all the pavement and gravel on William Oscar Emery. Um, it's in pretty good shape, so what we're looking to do is probably mill and overlay and maybe reshape the crown a little bit, but really the primary work effort will be on the outsides, the curbing area, and the multi-use path and sidewalk areas. So Riverside Ave is very residential, a lot of, a lot of properties right up against the, the roadway network, and you can see that continues to the next block here at Pleasant Ave. Um, but once we get past Pleasant Ave, the, the theme kind of changes, the character kind of changes. We have less residential properties. We now start getting to the frontage of Number One Pond. Um, and so our opportunity to kind of change the template, the roadway template, improves as we get in that area. So for that first block, the theme is consistent with Riverside Ave. Um, but as we depart from Pleasant Ave and we come down towards Lincoln Street, we're proposing a gateway treatment. We want to inform the, the users of this facility that you're now entering a different area. Um, and so we're proposing a center median. It'll be landscaped and the road, the travel lanes will travel around it. So it's kind of like a gateway. You've arrived to a, a different destination. Um, our multi-use path which was right up against the road, now starts to separate. And it now splits the distance between the roadway and the pond. Uh, many people have asked about the hedge line. There's a, there's a hedge line that runs around the perimeter of the pond and whether we'd be impacting that. And the answer is no. Uh, we're planning on maintaining that, that hedge line around the perimeter. We'll be working from behind that up to our roadway area with improvements. So you can see the theme here, the blue obviously is, is the pond. Uh, this little fainted line here is your, your hedge line. So behind that, we'll be proposing the, the pathway, um, should be very scenic. Um, and then we've got our roadway. We have many areas once we get into this stretch where we have eight foot shoulders to allow for on-street parking. Um, and um, Yeah, we actually had a conversation in our workshop this afternoon. Um, this seems to be the area where skating takes place, winter skating, and uh, the possibility of maybe extending that wide shoulder back in here to provide a few more places for on-street parking was discussed. Um, Ethan had mentioned uh, uh, pedestrian bump outs at crosswalks. Um, curb extensions. So wherever we have crosswalks, we're proposing the same through here. So where there would be a pedestrian crosswalk, we'd like to eliminate the on-street parking, make the shoulder narrower, and make our, our pedestrian crossing distance shorter and safer. Um, so we're proposing that at all locations of pedestrian crosswalks. Uh, 
Uh, now we're heading um, to the, the traffic circle. That is where the, the, the water skiers uh, participate, that one corner. It's uh, Edward Gowan Road, takes you up to the schools and the park. Um, we're proposing to change that, that intersection pretty significantly. Right now it's a traffic circle. We're proposing to eliminate the circle and, and create a T intersection. Um, in doing so, we can reduce our roadway footprint, our pavement pr footprint significantly. So uh, the bright yellow represents the roadway footprint as proposed. This lighter green is the existing pavement footprint that would all turn into lawn, to lawn areas or um, be, be reused for another, you know, another opportunity. So we see a much smaller transportation footprint here. The gray areas are sidewalks, so you can see sidewalks with esplanades, uh, which are these lighter green spaces, just grass or landscaped areas. Um, we have our pathway on the pond side continuing, so that theme will continue down. Uh, William Oscar Emery, now we're heading on the straight st stretch that takes us to River Street. As we, as we continue down, uh, we have recreation areas on the non-pond side, so we have strategic crosswalk locations with curb extensions to access those trails, those recreation trails, and there's a dog park a little further down on the screen. Uh, now this is the terminal end of William Oscar Emery, um, and we're tying into River Street here. So we had mentioned a gateway treatment on the other end. We're proposing a similar gateway treatment on the River Street end. So uh, a wide raised median that would be landscaped that separates uh, each uh, travel lane uh, on entry. Um, and then we're also proposing a pretty wide mid-block crossing here. This would be the multi-use trail crossing. Um, which would give them access to the dog, dog park that's located here, but also they can come down and get access to the multi-use trail that takes it eventually to the YMCA, to the schools, and thereabouts. Uh, this is a zoom in of the area of Edwin Gowan Road, uh, just showing how it's being reconfigured with Front Street um, in this area. There's a parking lot that exists up in this area here. We've had prior discussions with city staff about an opportunity to maybe extend it, uh, provide more parking in that area. Um, there could be opportunities to just, you know, reuse this space for food trucks for, during events and things like that on both sides of, of the, the intersection. Uh, this is some of the landscaping aspects of it. We have a full set of landscaping plans that we can make available um, in the Q&A. Um, the bottom left corner kind of shows you some of the landscaping proposed at the Gowan Road intersection. Um, but not only landscaping, but amenities, you know, uh, seating areas, benches, uh, bike racks. Uh, they're scattered throughout the, the number one pond corridor or this, this corridor of the road. So, um, as mentioned, we had a public meeting uh, back in May on this project. Um, we've kind of pumped the brakes a bit to let the, the raised grant projects uh, catch up to speed. Uh, some miscellaneous items. We're still early in the process. We're probably about 50% uh, complete on this one, so there's still a lot of work ahead of us. Um, and there's environmental coordination and utility coordination that we'll be doing um, and potentially appearing in front of site plan, um, planning board for site plan approval. And that completes the slideshow for William Oscar Emery. I will transition to Park and Ride Lot. Okay, so this is an overall view of downtown Sanford. Uh, Main Street is, is right in this area here. As you start heading down South Main Street, um, this is where the Cumberland Farms gas station is located. Uh, Emerson Street is just above it. Uh, I think this might be Emory Street heading out this way. It's a signalized intersection. Um, where the Cumberland Farms was, I believe that was city-owned property at one time. They also own the parcel behind it. So it was, I think, bisected when the Cumberland Farms came through. Positive on that. Um, so the next slide here shows what, what it looks like behind Cumberland Farms today. It's kind of an open field area. Uh, I think it's used for overflow parking for a nearby church on occasion, um, but it's a pretty, pretty vacant um, lot. Um, the upper portion of it is all cleared and field. The lower portion is wooded. Um, 
And then here's a view of what is proposed in this area. So I'll give folks a bearing. This is Main Street located here. Heading into town is in the up direction. Uh, this is Emerson Street here. The Cumberland Farms gas station is located here. Um, and then there's a parcel of land following my cursor that's city owned, it comes to here, it comes down to here, back to there, and then it continues back up to here and then continues across. So the city secured a, an easement, a permanent easement with Cumberland Farms to provide access into that parcel in the future. So they had some forethought and thinking ahead. Um, so there's actually, um, with this uh, park and ride facility or parking facility, there's gonna be proposed two access points, one which will tie into the existing parking facility at the Cumberland Farms, but it also gives direct access to the signal on Main Street. So we felt that was kind of helpful uh, and a secondary access on Emerson Street. Uh, this park and ride facility would be paved. Um, it's proposing 87 parking stalls, um, with a portion of them being handicapped stalls. Um, it's, we want it to be as complete of a, of a facility for future use as possible. Um, it's got two aisles with circular, um, circulation. Uh, it will be used for transit purposes. Uh, we have a transit stop here with a, a bus shelter pad and shelter located here. Our handicapped spaces are here. We have four stalls up in this area which will serve as just normal stalls for now but with the opportunity to maybe have those as EV charging stations in the future. Um, in terms of pedestrian access, we are providing for a sidewalk on one side of the facility that will connect into the handicap stalls, give access to the transit stop, but also continue across and access Emory Street with a crosswalk to the sidewalk that exists on Emory, uh, Emerson Street. Uh, the site also includes a small retaining wall. When we were doing the grading plan um, for this site, um, they required a small two to three foot high retaining wall on a corner here. And then this area back here is for drainage purposes. So we'd like to our, all of our drainage to come back to this area and we're planning a, a retention of pond in that area um, for water quality and quantity um, purposes. Um, the goal is for as much infiltration into the ground um, with our drainage uh, with this design as possible. A couple of typical cross sections. Uh, again, it's going to be reconstruction or new construction with gravel and pavement. We'll be picking the grades up a little bit. Um, we'll have in areas where we do have uh, curbing, it will be slip form concrete curb. Uh, this is a, a view of the grading plan as well as our drainage plan so it shows some proposed contours and how the site might grade with a goal of treating our drainage at this uh, detention pond in the backside. Uh, the site will be lit. Um, it's worth noting the, the previous project as well. There will be lighting for the multi-use path um, around the entire uh, perimeter of number one pond. Um, we will be uh, cut off fi fixtures, so we want to minimize light pollution onto adjacent properties. Um, so this graphic here just kind of shows what, what we're thinking uh, at the moment. And then this graphic here talks a bit about or shows and demonstrates a bit about the landscaping. Um, some of our earlier conversations with city staff, uh, the goal and intent of this site was to try to mimic the landscaping that exists at Cumberland Farms. So that is what we've attempted to do. Um, and um, we're providing some amenities and some fencing. Uh, the, the perimeter would be fenced um, along this site. Uh, similar to the previous project, there's utility coordination, environmental coordination that we'll need, need to do. We'll also need to do, um, we'll likely sit in front of the planning board for site plan approval with this project. And as mentioned, we're currently at 50% design. We actually just submitted this design to city staff a few days ago. They haven't really had a chance to, to review it, so you guys are seeing it before they are. So, And that completes my presentations.
Thanks, Ben. Thank God for Ben tonight. Okay. So up next, we're going to talk a little bit about where we see the project timeline. Project meaning all four presentations that you saw tonight. Looks relatively easy, right? Not a whole lot going on. Um, so with that, when you look at the, the dates that are on the screen now, you got the open house plenary public hearing that took place tonight. Uh, then, we, then we're all going to proceed to what we call plan impacts complete. That's where probably a lot of people are most interested in right now. What plan impacts complete are is the outer limits of all construction of each project, meaning all the, the grading, you know, any walls, any driveways, anything to do with the roadway, raising it, lowering it, it impacts the side of the road. So that outer limit is where we're all trying to achieve now. Um, so we're hoping to get there um, by December 23. So what we have in front of us right now is we got to look at all the roadway drainage. Basically what, what you've heard tonight is basically the road design itself, curb to curb, maybe the back of sidewalks a little bit, but now we've got to focus on everything under the road and exterior where that roadway footprint is going, um, which is a challenge. Um, and thank you for the utilities that are in the room or online or have been part of our utility coordination meetings. Um, that's what it takes. We all have to get in the room, start looking at what's under the road, what's above the road, what has to move, what gets added, uh, what conflicts we have. We still got a long road ahead of us to, to make that happen. Um, but I think we got a good, good footprint to start with and the communication is, is very key here. Um, so once, once we get that plan impact complete, we're going to come back down again. But associated when we come back down again, we'll, we'll dive into a little bit of the constructability of how all this is going to take place. You know, so when you look at the timelines on the screen, you know, the, the project to advertise, you know, from the plans and specs, from plan impact complete to the plans and specs, that's two years. So when you look at the properties that the abutting properties that are immediately next to the, the project limits of each one of these projects, there's about 300 property owners. You know, so we got to navigate 300 property owners to get to that PS&E complete package as well. Um, that's a, a really big mountain to climb when it comes to our process for roadway design and construction. Uh, so hopefully we can, we can expedite that, but that's a two-year process, maybe even a little more. Um, so when we come back next time, we'll have a better idea, better sense of that. Um, as well as obviously all the, the impacts that I talked about. There's walls out there, there's driveways that are going to change, um, there's area utilities that might have to move. All that impacts that PIC. Um, so hopefully when we come back in, in later 23, we'll have better answers for you. So based off when we get to plan, inspe uh, plan specs and estimate complete in 25, project advertise right after that, you know, late late December or January, hopefully. Um, bid openings in January 26. You know, then you're looking at project award February. Construction begins March, April of 26. With the federal discretionary funds, um, it also comes with a limit where you have to obligate those funds by. Um, that date is actually September 30th of 2026. So I'm trying to push as much as I can to get this on the street. Uh, the city has a lot going on, um, as we've all talked about tonight, and as Steve mentioned, there's more to come beyond what we've talked about. Um, so I know the importance of making that connectivity to that River, River Street project that's coming out um, with all these other projects, so all that connectivity can happen, you know, consecutively. Um, so based off that, you're probably looking at a three-year project right now. Um, like I said, the constructability, we all know it's not going to be easy. You know, so you have daytime, nighttime, you're probably going to have some detours mixed in. Um, and obviously, these are all in very easy locations, right? You know, you have the business impact, you have the traveling public impact. Um, you know, but in the end, I, I think you got a great project here. Um, as I've done a few of these in the past, not quite this big. Um, but I think in the end, I think everybody in the room will be happy. Um, so with that, I think 
we're at the point now where, you know, this is what Steve had kind of mentioned earlier. Um, you got the $25 million for federal discretionary funds. Uh, the state and city are right around $3 million apiece. Um, and there's also some federal flexible funding in there of $647,000. i am not sure exactly where that came from, but that's, that's basically what the project holds for, for funding. So with that, what, what I'd like to do is uh, turn it over to you, whether here uh, in the room first, uh, for any questions and comments to, to me or the team. Uh, and we'll answer them as best we can, and then from there we'll, we'll go to the audience on the, on the video. Uh, so with that, I'll open the floor. Uh, anybody internally have any questions at this time for the group? When people are shy to say something first. There. <laughs> uh, Maura Hurley. I have Maura Hurley. H-E-R-L-I-H-Y. -E um, we have properties on two of the projects. Uh, one is uh, on Cottage Street up at Jeunesse Lane, where it meets Jeunesse Lane, where the, where the two houses on Jeunesse Lane. So I asked some questions earlier um, about the slope. There's a huge change from when the first public hearing was. I don't know if everybody remembers that, but they were taking the whole slope down, and we were concerned about the noise impact in particular. So that doesn't seem to be happening. However, I'm, I, the question I failed to ask is, what kind of vegetation is going to be removed from that slope, and is there going, if there's a significant amount, is there going to be vegetation returned in areas, just like a wall would be returned so that there is some protection on noise? I guess that's one of my questions. I don't know if anybody's going to answer that or if you're just going to write it down. <laughs> yep, no, you know, the plan will be to obviously we don't want to leave that slope so it doesn't, you know, we got to leave it stable, exactly. you know, so there could be some plantings of some kind or some sort of vegetation to stabilize it. So that was one of my questions. It doesn't, again, nothing looks like it's being heavily impacted in that general area. Um, the other question I had on uh, Main Street is how soon in advance um, it, it, am I going to be made aware of what you're planning so that I can coordinate projects that I've been waiting to do I didn't want to do any projects that would then get destroyed by a, a major overhaul. But I own part of the sidewalk, which I'd like to redo, and you're going to be doing your sidewalk so they match up and they're untouched for years to come. And nobody, so that's sort of a question of mine and um, other little things so that I, you know, I and other property owners can be prepared, save our little portion aside and do projects that would help add to this, these great projects we're having in our yeah, I think probably when we come back next time, I'll be able to answer that a little better. The team will be able to answer it, <clears throat> excuse me, a little better because um, we're, we're kind of still playing around with what's exterior, that curb line. Um, so when we come back, we'll be able to tell you, you know, go ahead and do what you want from this area out because we've had that happen in a lot of places where people go out, plant trees and fences and stuff like that, then all of a sudden we come back through and rip it up. Um, but anytime you have any questions related to that as, as we get down through there, um, by all means, reach back out to us or me, um, and we'll be able to try to give you a better sense if you are going to do something like that. But I would say probably next year I'll have a better answer yeah, for you. Yeah, better. I mean, we had around the neighborhood, the city did a project that didn't look anything like I expected on certain sections of my property, and I have, you know, more landscaping to do to fix the slopes, et cetera, et cetera, and I, I want to be prepared for that. So I want to make, know in advance any major projects I might have to accomplish during that time. And I, I'm sure there are other property owners who feel the same way. I guess one of my final questions, I don't know if anybody knows this, but are you removing the tree between North Parish and uh, I'm at 883 Main Street, that nice big tree there? I am not sure right now. Um, again, with the utility coordination that we still have to that has to take place with the aerial utilities. Um, I'm not sure at this point in time. There are no aerial. Well, there's just a little bit cutting onto the property. Right. Um, we can certainly look at that after we after we get done tonight. Right now, if you want. Um, the other aspect of some of the things you're asking about is, so like I mentioned, that PIC point. Then we're going to do the right of way maps, and then we get the right of way maps done. They're going to have to appraise every one of those properties that have impacts. So you're actually going to have an appraiser call you and say, I'm going to come out and visit. I just need to come out and look at your property. And then from there, then you're going to meet a negotiator. We'll come actually sit down and show you those plans. So you're going to have 
pretty much two direct contacts and then with the design team you could actually have probably up to two or three more contacts before this project even begins. So every property owner will be going through that which is what you were talking about and I'm trying to like ask questions for other property owners. Who yep, if they're impacted. If there's impacts to that property we will talk to them and sometimes we don't impact properties but yet the roadway is getting rebuilt in front of their property so we won't talk to that property owner because we're not impacting their property. So that's why it's important as we make our way down through design that people pay attention to the, you know, the hearing times and dates so they can physically come ask those questions when needed. And on a final note, because you mentioned it, I've received one, other than the flyer you sent in the mail, knowing about this as a city councilor, paying attention like I do, I received a letter in the mail today, postdated the 15th for tonight. That was for me personally. I own two house lots back from my parents. My parents have did not, who are the ones right on the corner of Janest and Cottage, have not received any notice of this public hearing as of yet. And Townhouse Properties, which is the property A83 Main Street, did not receive a notice of this meeting in the mail separately from just flyers. So there wasn't anything official that actually got to us before this meeting. I just thought you should know that so you can be a little more on the final, I think it's important that property owners have a little bit of heads up to plan their Yeah, the one thing we're at right now with the, with the mailings is that we're basically going off tax maps and the mailing list that we pulled was that off the, the tax maps of the, of the city map? Yeah, it was off the GIS for the city of Sanford. I yeah. think what your problem is, <laughs> is the U.S. Postal Service possibly. I mailed an insurance bill in plenty of time and they canceled my insurance because it hadn't arrived in time. And it was two weeks after I'd mailed it. Yeah, I, I do know the letters went out on time so people would get them and I was going to say that there is some issues with some of the areas with the USPS. Um, I have it in my area, I haven't got mail in two days. Um, so it's, it's widespread. It is, I guess. I guess moving forward, um, just to follow up with some of your question here is, you know, there is going to be a website related to this project on the DOT website. Also, it'll be linked to the city's website. With all this information that we've mailed, presented, it'll all be up there hopefully soon, sooner than later. We've had some, some folks out at DOT that handle our web, website. Our webmaster's been out on leave a little bit. So hopefully after today, um, or tomorrow we'll have everything up to date on our website so it'll be live and once that happens obviously I'm going to reach out to the city and maybe at a council meeting in the future you know it can be mentioned that these these websites are live with accurate information. Yeah it would be nice to get um, property owners who are impacted directly to have you know early knowledge of that website so that they can continually check on what your progress, when meetings are, um, I know it's helpful for me, I know some seniors might not find this helpful but I suspect a great majority of the people along project groups would find it helpful. Yeah, exactly. And so on, on our website, you can actually comment, um, make a comment on it, and it'll come directly to me. Um, so that's another way to reach out directly and not have, hopefully not, hopefully the, the mail system gets a little bit better as we move forward here. But um, I would definitely reach out to me personally via the website if you have any, anybody has any questions as far as property owners that are here or not here tonight. Yeah, because when we had the first Cottage Street public hearing, there were quite a few people from the neighborhood, especially further out than I am out of town, because we all had the same concerns about the traffic, about the, the June Street turning. We don't, we, we don't fear the hill, we fear the people who come over the hill when we're trying to turn onto June Street, and that was a big topic of conversation at the first public hearing. So to not see many, any, I don't think any of the neighbors past me are here, and that's, my concern is they didn't get noticed. I, I remember it well. Okay. It was there. <laughs> okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Anybody else internally? All right, you're letting me down. I know there's got to be a lot of questions out there. Good evening, uh, Mike Termas, City Councilor. 
And I just want to say to everybody here, you know, talking talking in the open forum portion earlier was very helpful, um, the, well well planned. However, the Winter Street um, portion of that, where you're going to mitigate the, you know, the the, the traffic not, or the safety, I should say, the safety part of that. How how much of a of a plan right now do you guys, you know, focus on when it comes to safety when when you're speaking of vehicular traffic or pedestrian traffic? Yeah, it was brought up at our last public meeting. We we haven't spent a lot of time implementing anything. Um, we we will as part of final design. Um, it's got a flashing light right now at that intersection as a safety measure. Um, we're going to look to enhance that. It's looking at Winter Street itself. It's a state road. It's an arterial. It's a highway priority, corridor priority number one, which is, I think, pretty high up, one or two. Um, so um, we're going to take a look at the flashing beacon. We're going to take a look at the, the stop. What, what's happening is the stop conditions on, on Riverside. People aren't stopping. They're failing to yield, and they're, they're pulling out in front of traffic. Um, so... If we can mitigate that with um, more visible signage, stop signs, maybe their their LED flashing stop signs as one one option. We we had a similar project up in Auburn, high crash location. Um, we did we did uh, LED flashing stop signs. We actually did a raised intersection, so all the crosswalks were elevated. Um, so it requires all four legs of traffic, even the non-stop legs, to slow down to go over basically a raised table. The whole intersection was raised up to curb height. Um, the, the issue that we have with this road, it's it's an arterial to state aid road and they have restrictions. It's considered vertical traffic coming and there's certain restrictions for that. So it would require a special approval, um, kind of a design exception with DOT. But that is an option, one of the more extreme options that we can look at. We might consider flashing beacons, pedestrian flashing beacons for the, the, um, the side path crossing. We also had worked uh, recently with the Bicycle Coalition of Maine to do some pilot projects, some traffic installations around Sanford, and they had looked at that intersection in particular and uh, bounced an idea of a four-way stop there off of uh, Maine DOT Region 1 traffic engineer who just shot it down completely. You know, that's that's an arterial. You're not going to be adding a stop condition to an arterial, even in a demonstration situation. So those, those ideas that Don was mentioning... I think are good ones. I think the flashing beacon on RRFB, rapid recta rap rectangular rapid flashing beacon, might be a good one. That, that's the same kind of installation you see out in front of City Hall, gets the driver's attention. It's also very important that we don't overuse those because people do tend to get desensitized to them. So we, we want to be careful about where we put them in and, and make sure it's where people will pay attention and not take them for granted. Thank you very much. Appreciate you guys being here tonight. Thank you. All right, anybody else internally? Externally? I'm a member of the Southern Maine Garden Club, currently at Washington and Main Street. There's a, a traffic um, island, a landscape the island, Meridian. Is that going to continue or will that be removed? I didn't see it on the plans. The median island inside the intersection will be removed. Um, the s sidewalk in front of the trust building will be widened. Um, the trust building's basement is actually underneath the sidewalk, and as part of the project, we'll be um, extending the curb line away from the trust building, so there'll be a, a public right-of-way for pedestrians um, inside of the right-of-way. Um, as part of that, there are going to be some landscaped elements on that side of the street, so there may be an opportunity there to, to, to shift it to the corner, but the median island is, is, is planned to be removed as part of the, the project. And I think some of the those opportunities that you mentioned, Ethan, uh, where 
basically the sidewalk will have two different levels. There'll be a higher side to the sidewalk and a lower side to the sidewalk. We were talking about maybe instead of just putting in kind of a vanilla curb that someone would step down off of, maybe turn that into a planter opportunity so it would be raised, it would be elevated, it would catch the eye, and it would also be safe to maintain. You wouldn't have to be out in the middle of traffic in order to maintain uh, the garden opportunity. Along with that, I, I think it was also mentioned here tonight in, in the open house comments, is that along the William Oscar Armory corridor, um, Seth with the Cedar Landscape Architects has, has uh, got some landscaping medians in there, uh, one at River Street, uh, one at the transition between William Oscar Armory and Riverside Avenue. And then there was also a comment earlier that we might be able to take uh, Go and Park Drive and add a median strip there in order to create essentially three gateways to, to the recreational area. Uh, Seth, would you like to elaborate? No, I think that's a great idea. Um, any Anytime you can kind of create that access and that transition from street to a gateway to to notify or in a different area in particular, along William Oscar Emery makes a lot of sense given it, it feels more park-like. Um, and the plantings that we are proposing currently within there um, are salt tolerant and um, more durable plants and native. So I um, just wanted to put that out there as well because I know there's been some concerns in the in the past about what is gonna be proposed in those zones. I just wanted to add too that uh, although we haven't talked about it, there's, you'll see a lot of uh, green space on our plans as well in different areas. Uh, so there will be landscaping throughout the downtown projects uh, as well, uh, where there's some space in between the roadway and the sidewalk, and there could be opportunities there as well. You saw some of the uh, renderings that are there. So uh, that's something that we'll be working with the department uh, landscape team and kind of determining maybe there's other opportunities in certain locations as well for for something like that yeah I think with the overall project there's intent to add landscaping features to this to, to the entire project um, like Tony said we're early um, as we come back next time and we can analyze some of those bump out areas that were mentioned and look at the crossings and see if there's opportunities for that grass esplanade nod um, we'll see, uh, I think there's, there's a few places out there where we can replace what's being lost for sure. All right, one more question. Uh, Mike Termath, T-E-R-M-A-T-H. Um, on William Oscar Emory Drive, we have the, the Sanford Armory. And so they have, you know, quite a, you know, state, state owns that, that property right there, and there's a lot of frontage. So are you going to try to help tie in some of that curb appeal uh, towards the dog park? You know, from the Armory side, are you going to work with the state main of, uh, you know, Military Bureau and Veterans Affairs to try to, you know, get them on board to maybe do a curb or something right there in front of that location? Yeah, uh, the, through that area, the corridor is going to be consistent. So we want the same theme, whether it's landscaping, curbing, sidewalk, through that whole area. Um, looking at the graphics, it looks like we might provide. It's a wide open area, I think, right now. and We're providing two entrances. So we'll provide some, basically some access management in there, um, looking at the graphic on the wall. Thank you. All right. Well, I guess that concludes our public hearing for tonight. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, as I said, my, my contacts information is on the, the agenda. Uh, we'll get those websites up and running, which will be another mechanism for people to comment on. Uh, we'll get that information to Steve um, so he can mention it um, at the upcoming council meetings, just so everybody can go take a look at all the information presented tonight. Again, thank you all for coming.